Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for all of you who are taking your time and being here. Um, first, before we start our program, we would like to tell every member of the community to come here and be acknowledged for putting this event together. Um, Ms. McKenzie, everybody, Dr. Holfer, Ms. Dr. Kaplan, come here so we can acknowledge for putting this. Yes. And please, everybody, can we have a round of applause for them and putting this great event together? Thank you very much. Um, so welcome, and thank you for waiting. Um, this is the second annual President Colloquium, and this year's theme is the Spring into Science Fields of Opportunity. So the concept of the second annual President's Women Colloquium was inspired by the CUNY leadership um, conference at Hunter College. Um, in an effort to continue this um, community, um, the President Keyes felt that it was a very opportune time to showcase and highlight the performance of research in academia here at York College. Um, we want to discuss how our talent um, put together math, health and science, and most importantly, the women's community at York College. Um, today we will be discussing the, how women leaders here at York College define the success and challenges put in together and when they're going into academia, but as well putting it together with their personal life. So balancing work and life and the different perspectives that they have in the future. Um, we will be defining um, their perspective and a way of diversity as well as their leadership and service and how they manage this with a spir spirituality. Um, with that being said, we would like to start our talk with um, our faculty leaders, some of our professors who does, they, all of them do work here at your college, doing either research, teaching, any type of service um, in the your college community. The first of our speakers is um, part of the Occupational Therapy Department. I have the pleasure of meeting her for the past week. She's a great person, and she will be talking about her work. Um, her name is, <laughs> I'm a little nervous, um, Professor Lillian Kaplan, and she's an associate professor in the OT department. So I would like to, to give her applause. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, you don't often glimpse the path taken of the researcher or the presenter in front of the screen, so rather than talking to you about my data, I'm going to talk a little bit about the journey to get to the data. You see, in high school, I was good in art and science, and I wanted a career that combined both the areas of interest, and I had no money and no clue. So in my senior year of high school, I made phone calls as teachers, as parents, as friends of parents. There was no internet, right? And I found a summer fellowship at Rusk Institute. The summer fellowship is still offered, and here's the information for those of you who want to guide students into the health professions. Um, when I applied for this fellowship, I requested to be put in their Department of Medical Illustrating. But they offered me the fellowship in the Department of Occupational Therapy, and I was not going to say no. But it was there I learned from folks with spinal cord injuries and brain injuries, many of whom were my age back then, what, really meant, what it really meant to persevere towards a goal, and even if that goal was getting food in your mouth with your own hand. And I was truly inspired. So with a degree in occupational therapy and licensure in tow, I found an OT mentor in a position working with children with neurological disorders. And I learned from my OT mentor how to measure daily task behavior, how to be analytical, how to question what's being learned and observed. And at, at that position, I also joined your college as a faculty adjunct edu OT educator and while I was working as a clinician. I also got married, I had a child, kept working, Okay. When 
I had questions as a clinician, like why some children with cerebral palsy were not learning to move better despite my best efforts as a therapist. I turned to more education for answers. That education led me to research at the graduate level and my first master's degree. Research that led to more questions about neural mechanisms that drive interaction of cognition and movement. Meanwhile, I had a second child, stayed married, continued full-time clinical practice, and adjunct taught at your college. <clears throat> Finally, I was offered a full-time faculty position and left clinical practice, and I focused more on becoming an educator for my profession, still with a lot of questions about the relationship of brain to motor behavior. And that eventually required doctoral education. As part of the doctoral program in neuropsychology, I joined the lab of aging and dementia. The director there was doing research on attention impairments related to the development of aging brain. Now, attention impairments, not on the childhood end of development, rather than on the development on the other end of life, as we all develop aging, um, in old age and early Alzheimer's disease. So while on the neuropsychology doctoral program, I stayed married, parented, held a full-time faculty position at York, and completed my degree. So my doctoral uh, study was the relationship among attention, daily behavior, and disease severity in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So I looked at impaired attention, um, detection, orienting, selection. I looked at disease severity. I looked at psychiatric status in these patients. And I looked to see whether these things predicted declines in complex activities of daily living in patients with early Alzheimer's disease. So I used a test of daily living skills to identify the types of, the types of activities that patients were having the most difficulty with. And I looked at their scores on three tests, uh, aspects of attention. I looked at detection of stimuli, orienting of stimuli, and executive attention, which is selecting stimuli and distracting conditions. I also looked on their scores on cognitive measures and psychiatric measures. Okay. So the results showed Oh, go back, thanks. The results showed that impairment in attention processes paralleled the declines in daily living skills, and that the measures of attention, tapping attention demand, were actually more sensitive measures of how they would do on, and were more predictive of um, activity of daily living problems than either cognitive deficits on disease severity measures or psychiatric status. What was most important to me about this research, and what's most important to me as a clinical researcher, is to translate these kind of results into those who are working with a population like the Alzheimer's disease population. Um, so for clinicians, I felt that my research um, was really speaking to the issue of having to integrate better measures of executive attention to predict whether these patients can function at home or whether they actually need supervision or nursing home placement. For caregivers, my research results were translated to mean to me that education about the attentional demands necessary that these patients do um, would enable res caregivers to respond better if they had be uh, better understanding of what has occurring with the patients, and it would enable discussion of activity adaptations or specific tasks that they needed supervision with. Do I have regrets? Yes, I do. My biggest regret is leaving clinical practice. Um, I, I really see my direction now in clinical research, and it's hard to access clinical populations without having access to um, clinical folks and clinical people. Um, so it would be easier, not impossible, but easier if I had more direct access. My take-home message to all of you interested in the STEM sciences and health sciences is look for experiences. Look for lab assistant positions. Look for vo volunteer. Look for uh, internships like I had the opportunity um, 
and become inspired. Then you can persevere in your goal. You can get supports. You need supports from family. You need supports from friends. You need supports from mentors. You have to find, as you move along in this, in this goal, what questions you have. You develop your good questions. You're going to find um, that will enable you to persevere in your goals, to answer those questions. So in your search for answers, you'll develop more questions. And then, of course, you start to research. So thank you very much um, for listening. Um, I hope that um, our next presenter. So I would like for all of you to hold up the questions, because at the end of the um, presentation of the faculty, we're going to have a question of like a panel section. So if you can, please hold your questions at the end. So after each presenter present, we can have a panel discussion. But now, after this wonderful presentation of Dr. Kaplan and her experiences, we would like to introduce the president of your college, um, Ms. Marcia Keys. She's right here. She just got in. So we would like to see what she has got to say with us. Thank you. I came in midway to your presentation. I didn't hear all of it, but I do urge you in the audience to write down your question, the one that you have for Dr. Kaplan now, so that when you know the end of the sessions come, you'll be well prepared with your questions, okay? You can even do it while you're listening to me, because what I have to say is really uh, more of a just a thank you, really, uh, to all that are involved. I want to uh, first bring you greetings uh, um, from all of the student body here at York, our over 7,000 students. And as you probably know, about uh, 60 or so percent of our students uh, are female. And uh, I don't know the percentage in the sciences and allied health. Uh, allied health probably around 22%, and then the sciences maybe another 6 to 8%. So you represent a strong cohort of uh, students here. I also, since I know this number, want to share with you greetings from our about-to-be graduates. And are there any about-to-be graduates in the room? Just raise your hand or stand. Let's recognize you. Let's see you. OK. You are one of 885, I understand, who will be graduating this June 3rd. I look forward to seeing many of you at the June 3rd ceremony. And it so happens that our keynote speaker, our commencement speaker that day, Dr. April Erickson, a young PhD from NASA, scientists uh, will be addressing the audience. So it should be, it should be quite splendid. Um, so greetings to you all. Thank you for being here. A heartfelt thank you to the people who have been able to put this effort on in terms of the execution of it. As you know, last year we started this a little bit um, with some support uh, from the president's office. We continued it this year, but there are some significant people who we should acknowledge. Dr. Mandy Halford, who is in the audience. Mandy, thank you. <laughs> Ms. Linda McKenzie, who is on the side there. Dr. Lydia Gonzalez over here. Um, Dr. Kaplan, whom you've heard from. Dr. Naz Kandekar, I don't see Dr. Kander in the room, but his presence is always felt here on the campus. And Dr. Joanne Lavin, I saw her running from one other meeting to another, and I'm sure she'll come in later um, to, to say hello. And I also want to especially uh, give a little note of acknowledgement to uh, Dolores VP Swerin, who I know behind the scenes did a lot of work to sort of help put it together. So that's the, that's the committee. But what is nice about this is that, it, you know, what we're trying to do on this particular, for this particular occasion, uh, it was inspired really last year by a student, Daisy Manziania, an aviation student who attended the women, women's leadership uh, conference that is held within the university. 
over 300 women students. And um, during that day, it's a one-day conference that's held at Roosevelt House at Hunter College, there are very many speakers giving advice, providing inspiration, telling their own stories. And Daisy asked a question in a panel there. And the panelists didn't quite get the question, as sometimes happens. And they answered, somebody answered, but Daisy was not completely satisfied with the answer. I happened to be in the room, as were others. And at the end of the conversation, we went up and asked Daisy, what really was she getting at? You know, there was something behind the question. And it is Daisy's question and the something behind the question that got us to think about doing something like that here at York. And so last year was the first, and this year is the second. And we decided, with Dr. Halford's help, to twist it towards the sciences, because this year, the conference downtown for all of CUNY women focused on the sciences. So that is sort of the uh, genesis, if you will, of this particular program. What's really nice about it is that it's very homegrown. Uh, we see people who are much like us, who are not much older than us. I'm not talking about myself, of course. I mean you in the audience, who are, you know, practicing scientists, who are uh, uh, doing research, and who are living active and productive lives, both as scholars and women. And then we have our students also as part of that and the posters speak for themselves. So um, I wish you a great program. Unfortunately, as often is the case, it's a cameo appearance. I shoot in, I shoot out, because I've got to go to my Senate meeting, which is happening at 12.30. It's a regular meeting uh, held usually once a month where we do a lot of the work of the college. And so if you see me leave, it's not because I'm not interested. It's not because I have no interest in staying. It's because I have another commitment. But I do want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank all of those who led the effort. And I want to say have a very, very productive time. So congratulations to you all, those who are presenting, and those who are here attending. Have a great uh, forum. Thanks. Now, um, I would like you to remind you, we have this um, flyers in the top of the, of the table. In the back, it's a little survey of the event today. If you can just fill it out before you leave, that would be great. So we can have an estimate of how we did today. So now we're moving on to another professor, and it's an honor for me because she's part of my department, <laughs> the chemistry department. Um, she is a um, very, um, I would say, complex person. <laughs> she was my professor, and um, I'm very honored to introduce her, Dr. Yolanda Small. Thank you for the invitation. I've never heard myself described as a complex person. <laughs> I think we're all pretty complex in our own way. Um, but I am a new faculty member here at York, so perhaps I'm, I'm different from uh, what is uh, accustomed, or what you're accustomed to here at York. And my story getting to uh, York is, it's not so, you know, like Lou Diamond Phillips movie kind of story. It's very straightforward, very simple. Um, I'm born to Guyanese parents. Guyana, as you know, probably is a, in South America. My parents moved here when I was a teenager. And from that begins my American, uh, United States America phase of the story, where uh, we lived in Texas, first of all. And I ended up going to part of high school and undergraduate in Texas. And so my academic story begins at the University of Houston, 
where um, I tried many things. And so if you've gone through this phase of being an undergrad and tried different things, that's a part of your education. So it's not bad that you switched majors a couple times because I think I changed majors about three times. What was clear is that I was good in math and I was good in science, but what aspect of math and science I would use was completely unclear. So I started off as a, a med school major. I wanted to go to med school. I wanted to save the children. I volunteered at Herman Hospital, which is like the number one trauma center in Houston. And when I saw babies with their entrails open, I knew right then that is not for me. I, don't want, I was crying. I took that stuff home with me. I couldn't depart from it. And I realized, OK, I'm good in science, but this isn't where I would be because every day would be a stress. So then, again, being in Houston, what is it that you're bombarded with? It's an oil and gas industry. And so oil and gas industries come to my university. They're pushing all of their propaganda. This is where you want to be. You want to work for fossil fuels. You want to generate new power. You make lots of money. And so here I am. I'm going off to chemical engineering. I was in chemical engineering, taking all the math and science courses required. And around my third year, where you start your first engineering class, I took engineering, it's basically called engineering um, introduction, which is an intense combination of computer science, math, chemistry, physics, statistics, mechanics, and design and structure all in one. And somewhere between that course, that professor, and everything going on in my personal life, I decided engineering is not for me. I mean, I think I walked in there, and at every night there was stress, there was crying, there was breakouts, pimples like run amok, all kinds of things were happening. And I realized this couldn't be natural. I'm good at this stuff, but it's not natural that I'm feeling this much stress on a daily basis. What I liked prior to taking that class was all the, the math and science that I had. I've had all the calculus, all the differential equations, I'd had physics, all the chemistry up to that point because you take all the way through organic chemistry before you get into your first engineering class. And that was very comfortable. And so you know when you're in a comfortable place, that's where you're supposed to be. So in this engineering class, so I go to my professor and I ask him for help on whatever assignment he'd, he'd given me. And he said, um, you know, you're having way too much trouble with this stuff and you speak well. Why don't you go into broadcasting? I was done with him. That was the end of it. <laughs> don't tell me I'm going into broadcasting when I'm just asking you a question about science. And so again, I shifted gears and I thought, OK, being the practical person that I am, I'm not going to stay in college forever. So what can I use? Uh, what can I do with all the classes I've taken so far, still complete within a reasonable time, and still do the things that make me comfortable, this math and science stuff? And so I thought, OK, I have enough credits to major in math. I have enough credits to major in chemistry. But I can't distinguish between the two. I'll just do a double major in math and chemistry, get out in the same amount of time, and do what, what else I'm going to do with my life, which is, wasn't really defined at that point. And so I did that, double majored in math and chemistry. During my senior year, I, I did a, a rotation in a, a laboratory of a chemistry professor, ended up doing computational chemistry. And there, my path began towards computational chemistry. I got on a very interesting project dealing with uh, protein systems, where I was doing simulations on protein systems. So I thought, here is the, the medical aspect that I've always been looking for, but I couldn't deal with the bloody babies. <laughs> and I can, still, like, in, I can still contribute to the field that it was really interesting to me to begin with. And so that's my path. After I did undergrad, I ended up going into industry because there were a few student loans that needed to be paid off, and I just don't like people calling me. And so I worked in consulting for three years, doing, using the mathematical component of my education, doing uh, programming and, and software um, installations for large companies. And so that gave me the opportunity to travel. So I went everywhere from South Africa to Manchester in England to uh, Chicago to Virginia, living in all these places for six month stretches at a time, seeing the world, being very independent and free and loving every inch of it, but knowing that this isn't where it ends. This is just a phase along the process. Three years into that, I decided, OK, now is the time I'm ready to go to grad school. I apply for grad school. I get into Penn State. And funny enough, this is how life works out. The year that I got into Penn State, 9-11 happened, and half of nearly about 80% of the people that I used to work with in consulting got laid off. And here I was in grad school. And all those people who now wanted to apply to grad school applications were up in triplicate and nobody could get in because there were so many applications. And so it was this critical juncture, which I didn't decide. It was just kind of the time in the universe crossing paths in the right way that I ended up going to grad school right at the time where it was the perfect exit out of consulting and in industry for me to be in grad school. 
So I joined a group in grad school where I did more computational chemistry. I got exposure to not only biological systems, but material systems. And so all along this way, this is where I'm feeling comfortable. I wasn't stressed anymore. Everything falls into to life and balance. In, in the evening, I can sleep. There was a lot of stress in grad school, mind you, so that doesn't go away, but it's not the kind of stress that makes you wonder why you're existing at all. It's the kind of stress that, okay, this needs to be done. I do it, I stay up 24 hours in a row, I get some sleep later, it's fine. And so this is the kind of thing that I wanna to convey to you is that whatever you do in life, make sure you're comfortable with it every night. If you can fall asleep and say, okay, it's fine that I didn't sleep for 48 hours, but I'm good now. Now, this is where, exactly where you need to be. So that's my story, and I hope that whatever path you choose, you realize that the comfort is within yourself. And as long as you like it and you know that this is what you're supposed to be doing, then you'll be successful at what you're doing. And so I want to give you a brief introduction, if I have a, a little bit of time, to the research that I'm doing. So after grad school, I did a postdoc in Long Island at Brookhaven National Lab, and this happens to be a picture of the, the building, the Center for Functional Nanomaterials. It's a new building, only constructed about three or four years ago. And so the kind of work that's done here is that every, you remember my days in Houston where all the fossil fuel companies try to recruit me? Well, I decided now that I'm going to say blue to you because I don't want to do fossil fuel research. I want to do renewable energy research, and that's exactly the, the um, component that I'm doing, I did with Brookhaven that I'm continuing to do here at York. What we try to do is take catalysts and convert what's readily available. So there's sunlight everywhere in the world every day. There's water, which takes a, a large portion of the surface of the earth. And with those two combined, you can make a re an energy source, be it hydrogen or oxygen. And with those energy sources, you can maintain the quality of life to which you've grown accustomed. And so if you turn on the lights and you have electricity, or if you start up your car and you have gas to go, all of those things which currently come from fossil fuels now, me and a large group of people out of Brookhaven are trying to make it so that it comes from hydrogen and oxygen, which come from the sun and water. And so basically that's the, the main thrust of the work in my group. We look at the hydrogen economy and see what kinds of materials can we develop to do those kinds of reactions. And the tools that we use, we use mathematics, we use chemistry, we use physics, uh, condensed matter physics, we use a lot of uh, co uh, chemical techniques, um, um, tomography, uh, transmission electron microscopy, all kinds of things. And what we're going for is that the, what's pictured here is a fuel cell. And the simplest depiction of a fuel cell is that on one input at the end you have hydrogen, the other input you have oxygen, and through a series of membranes and flows that we create inside the cell, you can turn on a light bulb, which is powering our room right now. And so this is the kind of work that I try to do. I look at basically reactions like this. And so what, what we want to go away from is fossil fuels. And so what's pictured here is methane, which comes from fossil fuels. So hundreds of years of dinosaurs under the earth, which people go dig up or fight wars in Iraq for, they come for this thing. And all we want to do is get away from this thing because the output of that thing is carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, which warms up our earth and causes all these negative effects. With our new solution, all you get out on the other end is water clear water. It doesn't impact the earth in any negative ways. It lives on the earth naturally. And so this is the kind of the idea we're propagating. And so um, I don't have time to tell you all the gory details of my research, but if you want to come by, 3F01J, you can drop by and talk to me all the time. And that's my story. And that's all I wanted to share with you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hofer, for the sorry. <laughs> And now we're going to move to the math department, the exciting part of um, chemistry. Now moving to math. Um, the next presenter is Dr. Lindia Gonzalez. She's an assistant professor of the mathematics and computer science department. And she will be talking as well about her studies and her journey. Thank you very much. Come. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good, you having a good time so far? Yeah. All right, uh, as you heard, my name is Lydia Gonzalez. I'm an assistant professor in the math and computer science department. Um, in addition, I serve as a mentor to a number of students that are in the math education program. Uh, I'm just gonna make her a, a little bit embarrassed, one of which is Jin Zhu Hu, who's sitting over there and has a poster up. So if you have a little bit of time, that would be a, a good thing to look at later on. 
Um, I also serve as director of the York Tensor College Scholars Program, which is a math circle that we started at the school, um, aimed at challenging the underrepresentation of women in math. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, last, I also serve as the faculty liaison for something called the Success Cubed Program, which is basically a series of workshops that we organize to help students who are having difficulty with the CUNY entrance exam. So when we were preparing this talk, I was given three questions to focus on. And uh, one of them was, how, how is it you got involved in a career in math? So from an unusually small age, or young age, I knew that I wanted to teach. Um, I think around the sixth grade, I was wavering between math and science, but I was definitely sure I wanted to teach. Uh, basically, because I really, really enjoyed learning. And when you struggle with a problem for a really long time, and then finally, like, the light bulbs go off, and it makes perfect sense, like, I thought that was the best feeling ever. And if I could help other people feel that, that would be great. So that was basically what it is. Um, and I think my love of learning might have come from two things. First is that for the vast majority of cases, I had really, really supportive professors. I had a few who weren't, and you'll hear about them later. But mostly, I had some that were very, very, very uh, supportive. And I also had very, very supportive parents. Uh, my parents grew up in these very little farming towns in northern Spain. They came here about five years before I was born. And my mom really, really liked to study also. And she went to the town school, and she did really, really well. And the, uh, they nominated her for a scholarship. So as long as my grandparents were OK sending her to the nearest city, she could keep studying. But her brother, my uncle, didn't want to go to school. So my grandparents, in their infinite wisdom, said, well, why would we send the girl to school if the boy doesn't want to go? So the boy got sent to the army, because that's what they did. And the girl got sent to sewing school. And so when, see how short I am, I go, Ma, could you fix my pants? They're long. And she goes, go ask your grandmother. Um, so even though that's not what I would have hoped to have happened, it really pushed my parents to make sure that my sister and I studied. And their thing was, your job is school. Study whatever it is you want. Just make sure you finish. And I think like if you count like grads, you know, uh, elementary, grade school, whatever, whatever, we finished like nine times over between the two of us. And it shouldn't be a surprise that we both went into teaching. She's a third grade teacher right now. Um, when I think about why I wanted to study math, a couple of things come to mind. The first is that math problems to me felt like puzzles. So this was like some, I don't know, neat little thing that if I played that long enough, I could figure out. Um, the other thing is that I'm really fascinated by the fact that if you give two people the same initial conditions, and then they go off on like their own little ways, that they could get to the same answer. So I thought that that was really powerful and also really, really beautiful. And like I said, still for a while, I went back and forth between biology and math. I even took biology twice in high school because we had regular biology and AP biology. And I was like, this is cool. So I got to take it twice. <laughs> um, but the reason I went to math, I think, has to do with the fact that I had a teacher in high school who realized that I had an interest in this and kind of included me in the mathematical discussion. So uh, she brought in articles about math for me to read. Uh, she showed me different problems that, or, or discoveries that weren't necessarily part of our regular classwork. Uh, I helped uh, in her classes as a grader and as a tutor. Um, and I think that being surrounded by math like that and being able to kind of like try a little bit of teaching because you get to tutor someone or help someone out, that, that, that kind of like led me to think that, yeah, this is the subject for me. So I studied math education. I have a bachelor's and a master's in that area. I got a teaching license from New York City, well, in New York State, I guess you have to get as well. And I went to teach in a New York City public school for seven years. Uh, while I was there, after a while, I started facilitating workshops for the uh, teachers, like professional development workshops. And I said, well, this is kind of fun. I like working with the teachers. Um, and then I started realizing that, hmm, I get to influence all of these students. But if I work with these teachers and they influence all those students, and that, that's kind of rewarding as well. So that kind of started sneaking into my mind. And I said, OK, maybe what I want to do is I want to pursue a doctorate in education so I can work with the people that want to be teachers. Um, and that's kind of why I went to that. There's also another thing that led me to the doctoral program. And that was that, in my opinion, the students at my high school were consistently being marginalized academically and with respect to math. Um, research points to the fact that math can be a gatekeeper for future careers. I just think about it. You want to graduate from high school, there's a math test. 
You want a GED, there's a math test. Grad school, math test, law school has a math test. You want a civil service job, you need to pass a math test. Um, if someone decided that dancing was that important, then somebody else would be giving the talk today, because um, that wouldn't be me. Um, and so I noticed that uh, the students at my high school, it was a really very underperforming school and quite disorganized, uh, but they weren't really receiving the academic preparation that would help them be successful members of society. So I felt like they were walking out with a piece of paper that said they were ready, but I didn't feel like they were ready. Um, and so despite my best efforts, I, I thought that they were being done a disservice. And I really wanted to challenge this, so I started looking into issues of equity in mathematics and ultimately into the idea of math for social justice, which is what my primary research is. Now, before I get to that part, there was another question I was supposed to answer, which is, what's the biggest mistake you made during your career path? That's right, let's stand up in front of a group, uh, room full of people and admit to one's greatest mistake in our career path. Um, <laughs> So I really thought about it for a while, and I know work at the high school was challenging, but I really liked it. Um, same thing for my work here. I really enjoy being here. I've been here for almost three full years. Um, but I decided to call my presentation the Mathematics of Inclusion, and that's where I started realizing that my biggest mistake had to do with um, not fully developing a math identity and not challenging those people that said that I shouldn't be doing this or I couldn't do this right. Um, so let me give you a little bit about that. I attended a really prestigious university with a very well-known and re respected math department, but I was in the education department. Now, never mind that we took all of our math classes in the math department with the math majors. Um, in addition to that, I had AP classes, so I took even more math classes because I had the space and I thought it was fun. Uh, so you have this going. And I would argue that at the time anyway, I was as mathematically prepared as all the math majors that sat next to me in class. But there was a clear culture of math exclusivity at our school. Uh, those in the pure math department didn't really talk to those of us in the education department. And there was kind of like an elitist going, elitism going there. And so little by little, I think that chipped away at my confidence and stalled the development of my math identity. I had a class where I was the only girl in the class. So all of the Guys in the class were called by their last name. So Mr. So-and-so, what's your thought on this? Well, I got called the girl. So let's ask the girl what she thinks about this problem. Um, you shouldn't put up with that, right? We don't need to put up with that. But at the time, I didn't know any better, and I didn't think anything of it. And I went, oh, that sucks, but all right, oh well. Uh, then I had another professor that insisted that all of the valuable contributions to math had been done, made by men, and I needed to understand this. And when I asked for a book on the history of math, he recommended something called The Men of Mathematics by E.T. Bell. I read the quote that starts every single chapter, threw the book on the floor or under the bed or wherever, and then I sold it on Amazon like 10 years later. <laughs> I never read it. Um, then I had another professor uh, where I went over and said, I I'm not understanding this concept in class. And he said, well, that's an elementary concept. You should know that already. I said, I don't, sir, so can you help me with it? And he says, what, what, what are you studying anyway? And I was like, math education. He goes, well, that's your problem right there. I was like, OK, thank you, sir. Um, so those are the not so good experiences. And there's really no excuse for people you know, doing that and talking that way. But it's kind of like similar to what happened to my mom, you know, just in a different space and in a different situation. So I became really, really concerned um, about this idea of using mathematics to exclude others. Um, and I thought that mathematics should be used to include others. If this is what people are saying is important to get you a good career and get you to the next place, then why aren't we getting more people involved instead of trying to keep them out? Uh, so that actually led to my research interest, which is in math for social justice. So basically, you take math to understand different social issues and different inequities in society, and then you use that math to try to advocate for change in those areas. So I worked with teachers around this area, uh, looking at their own math identity, their beliefs about the nature of math, about teaching. Um, together, we crafted math units based on the uh, experiences of the students they teach, so linking the math to what the students are comfortable with and what, what they're used to. Um, also mentioned that I organize a math circle at York called the York Tensor Scholars. One of the things we do is that we bring in speakers, much like we're doing here, 
uh, to share their experiences, to talk about their research. As much as possible, we bring in female speakers, and we're really trying to like challenge the underrepresentation of women in math. So we've had a number of really good talks. Uh, someone came in and talked about the mathematics behind knitting. She was looking at different round objects. A hat's round, but there's too much middle, so it sticks up. But a uh, tablecloth's round, and the middle and the edge are perfect because it lays flat. She had something else. I can't tell you what it looked like, ex what, what it was, except that it was very curly on the edges. And she said, OK, this has too much edge and not enough middle, so you can't flatten it no matter what you do. And then she throws up this equation that you can use to figure out which of the three cases you're in and how much of each you need in certain cases to make the thing lie flat, which was just brilliant in my mind. Um, we also had someone come in and talk about the use of lasers to figure out an urban landscape. So I can't really see what's ahead of me, but I shoot these lasers out, and depending on how they come back, we can tell if there's a tree there or a car or something else. Um, what I really find it interesting, after, after these talks, we take the students out to uh, eat, share a meal with the speaker. And what I always find interesting is how uh, the students kind of expect that they won't have anything to talk about. Like, we're all going to sit there and throw out some big formulas, and they're going to be sitting there like, I don't know, but this is tasty. <laughs> right? Um, the first speaker that came was great. Uh, she, her name was Diana Thomas. She kind of walked in with a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and a five-year-old next to her and her hair in a ponytail. And so uh, we're, we're in the room, and uh, one of the students says, so who's the speaker? And I was like, she's like, what? That's a speaker? I was like, well, what were you expecting? And you could probably close your eyes and think about what jumps to mind traditionally when you think of a mathematician, and I'm sure that's what she was expecting. <laughs> A little bit later, uh, the speaker was there, and I wanted to clean up my office so that we could go to dinner and, like, you know, put my things away. And I told one of the students, why don't you sit here and talk to her a little bit? You know, i got to get my stuff together. And she goes, yeah, but I don't want to talk to her. I don't know what I would talk to her about. I don't know, I don't know what I would say. So we sat, I sat down with them. We started a conversation. I walk away. Um, I come back. All my stuff's put away. We're like, oh, yeah, we're leaving soon. And I noticed that the two of them are going on and on and on. It turns out they both had five-year-old sons. And they were talking about how the school had called them because there was some problem about I don't know what. Basically, something that I have no experience in at all. And so if you would have walked in at that time, you would have said, that one, that one's the odd one out. And these two have something in common, and these two are, are together. So it was kind of an exciting thing. Um, actually, what I'm doing right now is I'm, I have a research study that's looking at the uh, impact of being in this program for those particular students. So I had one more question I was supposed to address. This is how I balance career, family, this, that, and the other thing. All right, the honest answer is that I balance them quite poorly. <laughs> uh, it's something that I'm really trying to work on. People that know me know that I'm very good at agreeing to things. And oh, that sounds great. Oh, yeah, I'll join that project. That sounds good, too. So it's something that I'm working on. Um, hopefully, from hearing other people talk, and from today, I might pick up some good tips. Um, that's pretty much it. Thanks for listening. Um, I would like to ask the speakers, Dr. Small, Dr. Kaplan, and Dr. Gonzalez to come up so everyone who has their questions, they can ask all the questions that you want, and we have 10 minutes to do that. Okay. Does anybody have any questions to the professors that have in front of us? Please.
Hello? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's not for that. Okay, so um, tomography is basically the landscape of something. You can get a tomography of a piece of earth, for example. Like if you do Google, and it shows you the different heights of mountains and versus valleys and so on. So you can do the same kind of picture for any model. And so if you're studying basically the energy landscape of a system, you're basically getting a tomographical picture of the energy landscape. And so the energy landscape will also have these peaks and valleys, like the landscape of the Earth. And in the, each of those peaks and valleys, you can figure out different energy minima of the system. And at those minima, certain reactions happen. And if you want to look at where the reactions happen, you're basically surveying the landscape, which is the potential energy surface, and looking for those minima where re certain reactions happen, and then you can understand certain processes. So your second question, which I, I what was? Oh, that's a question. Was explaining about the um, programming and knowing and the background about protein. Oh, proteins. So you can do simulations on proteins. So protein systems are, are enzymes. So enzymes are the catalysts of proteins, right? And so, uh, say, take an enzyme that you know. What, what enzyme do you know about? Like from your, your experience going to the doctor, the doctor said something, something's... <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let's say, let's take a protein in the brain that's responsible for Alzheimer's. And you want to understand that protein and why Alzheimer's is a, is a disease. You basically can reconstruct that in a computer by placing all the atoms in a certain configuration that looks just like the protein in your brain that causes Alzheimer's. And then you can run simulations, which are mathematical codes that basically change the configuration of the protein in response to certain stimuli. And when you understand what makes the protein behave in a certain way, you can basically backtrack it to why Alzheimer's is a problem and come up with drugs that inhibit the protein at certain steps along the way so that you can have a cure or some, some form of curing the symptoms of the disease based on the simulation that you've done. Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out if the mic works, so everybody... Does it work? Yes. Yay! Okay, <laughs> so you can pass it around. Any other questions for Dr. Kaplan, who spoke about her work in the OT program and her journey, and Dr. Gonzalez, who gave us a brief story of her life? Well, I have questions, because I'm a, I myself am a student. So I would like to know, like Dr. Gonzalez said, like all the challenges that we have along the way, what have somebody said no to you like from the get-go and said that no you couldn't make it like no you cannot make it and how do you overcome that like i, I, I believe you dr gonzalez talked about that and um i would like to know how you just challenge it out and overcome that i i don't know that i had anyone that said flat out no but i definitely <laughs> got messages that you know certain people didn't necessarily belong um, in the different apartments where I was. And I, I guess it's just a matter of realizing that you do have the ability to do these things. And there were enough people around me that thought that I could um, that kind of really challenged the idea that some people thought that I couldn't. Um, I also had the uh, negative experience of someone going, I, I had done really well throughout school, and I also had people saying, but why would you want to be a teacher? You know, you're so smart. Why would you want to be a teacher? Wouldn't we want the brightest people being the teachers? Like, what is this about, you know? Um, so I think I was just lucky that for the few examples I gave you of people being very negative, I did have a lot of examples of people being very positive. I mean, like, my family was very, very supportive, and a lot of my teachers along the way were as well. I don't know if that answers it fully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other thing about when people say no, if you have a real goal in mind, and you mm -hmm. can't do it through that door. Yes. You search right. for a window, mm -hmm. or you search for a hole in the floor, or you search for another door yep. that's going to open in a different way. And sometimes, um, you know, what do they say about the mother of invention is, you know, <laughs> sometimes necessity. I mean, you have to really, uh, especially in these fields that are sort of going in different directions, you have to kind of say, this is where I'm. I, I really am inspired. This is really what I want to do. And there's a lot of winding and a lot of different roads to get there. 
Um, I would say uh, being told no isn't necessarily a bad thing because I think every time I've experienced yeah. someone saying no, it made me either think seriously about what I was doing at the time or think about what else could be better, that I could el what else I could be doing. So, for example, I mentioned that engineering professor who told me, you know, I should try broadcasting because I speak uh -huh. well. And it made me think about broadcasting for like five minutes and realize that that's not where I wanted to be, but I redirected my thoughts enough so that I, I put myself on a path that was comfortable for me. So no isn't bad. So don't feel when someone tells you no that they're against you. It just causes you to redirect and, and really process where you are so that you know that you're on the, the track that you're supposed to be on. Thank you. Do you guys have any other questions? Anybody from the audience? Do you have another question? Is the question oh. to everyone like, with your you know, presentation, it seemed like life was busy, you know, Dr. Gonzalez was participating in so many different projects, and Dr. Kaplan was establishing a family and children and things like that. And Dr. Small, you were traveling and things like that. So where self-development took place in all your busyness? You know, I know you, Dr. Gonzalez mentioned that, you know, you're still trying to see how you can balance personal life and professional life. So that's still processing, but in other ways, how did self-development self work? So self-development, where does it come in place? I guess all of the different um, activities that you do and all of the different situations that you find yourself in are going to, you know, help um, help you become what, what you're going to be. I don't know how to, how to explain it any better. Uh, I, I am involved in a lot of stuff because I, I find that the different things I'm interested in are, are rewarding. And so on the one hand, yes, there's a lot going on, but on the other hand, they're rewarding experiences, and they're experiences that are definitely going to help me um, become a, a better individual, um, whether academically or a, as an educator or as a friend or the things of that nature. Um, I think it comes down to doing things you like. I gave a presentation to a group of high school students the other day, kind of like a, you know, this is what math is like, and, you know, look at all these great careers that have math, and look at how much money you can make if you study math, and they're all like, woo. And then I stopped and I said, but if you hate math, then who cares how much money you're making if you're not happy? So, yeah, there's lots of stuff going on, but if we get involved in the things that bring us joy and bring us, you know, a feeling of, of accomplishment, I guess that's good. And we learn from everything that we're a part of. I have a, a quick comment about your question. And I think the answer to making space in your life for your own development is help is getting help from others. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's, um, I don't know if it's because we're women or because we're interested in these fields, we have, we're very goal oriented. We tend not to ask people for help. And those who are graduating, mm -hmm. I'm hoping can agree with me, and those who are in the other programs in this college that are, are intensive, um, you have to you have to have folks. You know, no one goes through these kinds of degrees or these kinds of um, experiences alone. You really need people who are going to support you, and that may mean somebody cooking a couple of nights a week for you while you're in the library, or somebody watching your child when you're not available, or you know, someone um, helping you do the laundry if you only have a half an hour. Right? It, and and that's what that's really. You need the wind beneath your wings. You need that. You need to ask for it. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure I understood the question until they answered. So, <laughs> notes, right? um, so self-development. I don't. If, if if I think about if I interpret the question correctly, you're asking how do you keep yourself strong while you're doing all these other things? Is that what you're trying to ask? Well, I think it's, it's, it's the balance that they also talked about. So, for example, I, I'm a big fan of lists. And all the things that I need to do, I put on a daily list, including, you know, I have to read a paper, grade the lab reports, call my grandma, and pick up a bagel for my husband that's a certain kind of bagel that he likes. And all of those things get checked off at the end of the night, and that's all I can accomplish, and I'm okay with that. So you have to be okay that there are not enough hours in the day to fill everything. But if you made a list of the things that you've prioritized, and you've accomplished them in that day, you can sleep well and wake up the next day for a whole new list. So, I mean, so, I mean, maybe it's the, the trait.
training uh, the, of being in, in pr computer programming and all these things. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have an algorithm, and I, I think I conduct life with this algorithm. Yeah, like Everything that. goes in lists, and I'm okay with it. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Let's have a round of applause for the professor. It was lovely. Now we're going to go with the exciting part of the one program. Last oh, one last question? Oh, I cannot see. With it. Okay. Yeah. sort of like having these different individuals that would put down what you might be capable of and kind of like letting that seep into your head. You know, so at one time in the high school, I was teaching in this, this uh, student said, hey, this, what'd you decide you wanted to be a mathematician? And like, it felt awkward to me. I was like, mathematician? No, I'm a teacher. You know, like I had gotten it in my head so much that, you know, it felt awkward when I was called this. Or when I was coming here, and I'd be in the math department, and for a while I was like, I'm a little worried, you know? I'm going to be the only person in the math department that has, like, you know, certain books on their shelf or publishes in certain journals. You know, how might that be looked at? So I think, um, which was fantastic, by the way. I have extremely supportive colleagues, and they're very interested in matters of education and in matters of inclusion. So I think it wasn't necessarily an, an act that I wish I could take back, but rather... Um, having more of a, of a belief in my own mathematical Who's identity. Who's missing a clicker? You missing a clicker? Who else? Clicker? Everybody has one. Everyone needs to have one. Okay. okay. So everybody's ready to click, right? We're gonna click, click, click now. <laughs> okay, so Tanika, she's gonna come by and explain to you. Yeah, I'm gonna explain. The screen? Oh. Put it on. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. Oh, okay. uh, and this is it live. We have a little technical problem. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> we're gonna be. Okay, the projector is on. Yay. Hello. Hi. My name is Tamika Scotland. I'm a candidate for 2012 um, graduate um, in psychology. I'm associated with the Women's Center. And um, I hopefully I aspire to continue my career development in um, health science, which is going to be me. Um, I have a few questions, seven to be exact. And I'm going to test your um, knowledge on STEM and health science to see how much you know. It is short, brief, and it's very simple. Um, as she stated, the keypad has um, between A, B, C, D, you just pick one, which one you pull back, and we're going to see the results on the screen. All right, um, which examination are used to test applicants in the field of nursing? You can start clicking. So click the answer. Yes. <laughs> Is oh, it one, two, three, one, two, or four? For nursing. Everybody? Everybody press and click. Okay, stop clicking, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Cha 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 Sean. <laughs> Okay. Hey, 
Yeah. So we have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, three. Everybody got the coach. <laughs> <laughs> so eleven percent said MBA and AMCAD. No. MCAT is for medical school and MBA for master in business. Okay, the next question is, in what major at your college can you obtain a BA and MS? <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on. Oh, wait. Now you can start clicking. Stop clicking. <laughs> no, start. Oh, start. Yes. <laughs> Oh, it's coming. Hey, everybody knew that. <laughs> everybody knew it's OT. Okay, the next question is, this past academic year, over 100 students applied for the entry into the York College Occupational Therapy Program. Only blank students were accepted. So how many students? Start clicking now? For the next upcoming year. Just click one. We'll see the answer. Click. Guess. Okay. Okay. And. Actually, I'm sorry to tell you, but the answer is four. Uh, <laughs> ten, ten to twenty-one is the actual answer, even though people voted for fifteen to thirty. Okay. Let's move on. But <laughs> the National Science Foundation, because this should be about learning. Okay. And what we want you to come away from with regards to that particular question is that there is a lot of preparation that one needs to engage in before you apply. So you need to know what you need to do to be successful to gain admittance into the OT program. Okay. So the previous, for the interest of class of Fall of 2011, 32 admissions, so 32 students were admitted to the program to clarify the answer of the, qu the previous question. And there's a question here. How oh. long <laughs> okay, um, our next question is, the National Science Foundation, in collaboration with CUNY, awards a following scholarship in STEM at York College. You can start clicking. The scholarships at York. I know, I know. I think I know. <laughs> you need a clicker. Click, click. Everybody finish? Everybody know the scholarship? Okay. Yay. Yes, you are correct. What is the answer? Number one, LSAM, the Lewis Stark Alliance program. I know that because I was there. <laughs> okay, and the next question is, what is the 
if you declare a minor at your college, will it be listed on your actual degree? Yeah, if you declare a minor, will it be listed in your degree when you graduate? Yes, no, maybe. Actually, no, it's not listed. <laughs> That's the answer. No. Okay. Oh. Majority said yes. <laughs> Course, the answer was no. Okay. According to payscale.com, persons on their bachelor's of science and geology can expect to earn a salary range per year of. A geology major when he graduates, what do you think is going to get paid? <laughs> <laughs> it should be included here. <laughs> Guess. Guess no. And the answer is... Wow, the answer is um, C, I mean three, that's the answer. Fifty to hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and the last question? Oh. Yes? Oh. Sorry, I had a problem with the last question. Um, it wasn't going to register, so... The answer, if you were to do um, chemistry in early education, you will be able to get um, a chemistry, you will be able to teach chemistry from 7th to 12th grade, and you will have a chemistry BS. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you so Thank you, Tanika, for the clicker section. It was kind of fun, the first time I see this. <laughs> so now we're going to move up to the last part of the program, and I would like to introduce to the person responsible to encourage students for research here at your college. He is the Dean of the Art and Science School at your college. Please give a round of applause to Dean Melatees. Good afternoon, everybody. Wow, this is the best audience I ever had. <laughs> Even my chemistry classes are 50-50. This is nine, more than uh, like 90, 10 women. Uh, I was charged to talk to you about uh, opportunities in education and professional development in, uh, at your college and everywhere when you study sciences and health professions. It was a long time ago that women weren't really accepted or allowed to study certain fields, and uh, some of the professions were, became, by necessity, women fields, like being a high school teacher, for example. If you go to most of the high schools, most of the teachers are women. Uh, like nursing, most of the nurses are women. We came to the point that we developed programs to attract uh, men into the nursing profession. And uh, if you are a man and you want to be a nurse, there is a lot of support for that. People will give you scholarships and all these things. Uh, it was a long time ago that women weren't even uh, able or weren't admitted as easily to the medical schools like uh, they are today. Or in some cases, if you were an older person, you would, uh, or over 25, you weren't going to be able to be admitted to the medical school. So there is. Uh, we have come a long way since those times, and today, although we, did, we are not where we are supposed to be, it's a little easier, uh, a little more acceptable, if you want to put it that way. And there are a lot of opportunities, and your college is a good step. It's a good first step and a very competitive first step for people to reach into programs, into study, in competitive programs, in health sciences, and in the sciences. At your college, you can become a pre-med student. You can study biology uh, through the biology program or chemistry and uh, complete the requirements to apply for medical school. You can study in our nursing programs. You can study in our physician assistant programs. But I think some of the programs that are not in people's minds are the fu fundamental sciences, 
are biology, mathematics, chemistry, physics. And there is a great need in the United States today, and probably all over the world. People don't really like to study what they consider as hard uh, subjects, as tough subjects. They don't like to study mathematics, and I've heard this one in conferences all over the world, that mathematics is not my thing, chemistry is not my thing. Even my own cousins, when I tell them what I am actually doing, they go like, chemistry was never my thing. So, uh, but in the colleges, we offer and we try to do as much as we can do to uh, help students studying in these subjects. We offer instructional support, we offer, which is going to help you with your classroom work. But we go a step beyond that. We are not only, we do not only want you to succeed in your classes, to get A's in your classes. Don't get me wrong. Getting good grades in your classes is the first step in being accepted into a nice graduate program or getting a nice job. Because when the people are, are reviewing your resumes and when you are going for jobs, they are going to look at your grades. Make no mistake about it. Your grades are important. And they are the ones that are going to give you uh, an entry to the field that you want to go. But also, there are other things at the college that you need to go after. And those are possibilities for internships. Many, many people cannot really understand that you are actually learning and getting paid at the same time. So at the college, our faculty, your college faculty, they do a lot of work and they write a lot of proposals to external agencies and to the college itself to raise money to support undergraduate research assistants and in some cases graduate research assistants. Well, through special programs, we might be able to support graduate research assistants. And this is for all, all the people, it's not only for women, but for your college, since most of the students are women, that benefits women. And uh, it's very important that you do not stay with the past. Do not think that what was not happening in the past, uh, that what was not happening in the past cannot happen today. Like I said before, traditional history says that some professions are exclusively women, some, and uh, for some professions, women kind of were discouraged to go. Today, we want to encourage you. We want to go to study. We want you to go and study what you like, what makes you excited about, whether that is going to be a degree in chemistry or a degree in occupational therapy. If you have it in your heart to work with people and uh, be sympathetic to them and help them out throughout their lives. I would be very glad to answer questions if you have some. Other, uh, otherwise, I need to go to other meetings too. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you very much. Um, right now, I just, I just got said that Dean Thomas Gibson is here. And he would like to just give a little bit of regard from, because he was supposed to be here, look, but now that he's here, let's just welcome him and see. Please give a round of applause to Team Thomas Gibson. Thank you for making it. Thank you, thank you. I don't really need the microphone, do I? No. Not so much, okay. I just wanted to say, first, I'm sorry that I was late. Um, the students have me working extremely hard for them, which I'm very always happy to do. But I, I'm excited about having this discussion on science and the role that women play in science, actually. So I just wanted to say that these types of discussions must continue. I want to see more female students pursuing uh, different fields in STEM. I want to personally thank Linda McKenzie and her staff for always putting together a stellar event. So can we please recognize her and her, and her team? And I would also like to acknowledge the faculty members who serve as mentors to our students, who work extremely hard to encourage students to try a little bit harder, to put in that extra effort, and to show them that anything that they choose to pursue, especially those more difficult fields such as the science, 
are achievable. So thank you, faculty members. Okay. And on the behalf of the Division of Student Development, anything that we can do to help you, uh, rather it be a letter of recommendations, rather it be some funding support for study abroad, anything that we can do to help you in your educational journey, we're happy to do so. So keep up the good work. Study abroad. Oh, yeah. For, for students. Oh, yeah, I'm a student. I'm a oh, student. Okay. I'll stop by. <laughs> okay, so now we go, we got, are in like the final stage of our program. And this is, I think, the more excited one because I'm a student and I've been in that position of giving an oral presentation. But the next presenter is actually a doctor. She is a postdoctoral scholar in Dr. Mandy Holford Laboratory. Her name is Dr. Prashi Agnes. She's going to talk to us about her study here at York. Let's give a round of applause for her. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Prachi Anand. I did my doctorate from University of Delhi, and I'm doing my postdoctorate here with Dr. Uh, with Dr. Mary Hall Ford at Chemistry Department. So, uh, first of all, I, as uh, it is a yeah. so first of all, we are here at the event of. Uh, women in science. So first of all, I would like to talk about the women in science, that the women are not new to science, and uh, uh, the, the women are, uh, uh, they, they have been participating in the secrets of, um, in, unraveling sec uh, in unraveling the secrets of nature since the dawn of civilization. And uh, you know, while in 18th century, uh, century was characterized by three divergent views towards women that for the first was women were mentally and socially inferior to men and the second was they were equal but different and the third was that the women were potentially equal in both mental ability and contribution to and uh, contribution to society. So similarly, many well-known individuals, such as Jean Taquiz, believe that the women's role were confined to motherhood and service to their male partners. But enlightenment was a period in which women experienced expanded roles in the sciences. And uh, here I am pointing out uh, a, view, a few very famous women in science. So first is the Maria Sibella Marian. So she was from uh, uh, 17th century, and she was the founder of modern botany and zoology. And she spent her whole whole life in uh, investigating nature. And then the second picture you see here is Mary Curie. Like everybody would be knowing her, and she won the Nobel Prize two times: first for physics, and then for chemistry. And the third one is Maud Menten. Like most of us would be knowing the enzyme kinetics, menten michaelis equation that has also been given by a woman. And uh, the last one is Franca Esparza. She, uh, she was a French uh, virologist, and she was also awarded with the Nobel Prize in 2008 for her discovery for the uh, human immunodeficiency virus. So, and uh, with these women, there, there were so many other women who have been working for science and society, and. Um, and uh, I, I have a data with me which shows that since 1966, the number of women in receiving bachelor's degrees in science and engineering in USA has increased almost every year, reaching to 2,283 in 2001, which was like half of the bachelor degrees awarded that year. And a similar case was with the doctoral degrees also in science and engineering. So. Uh, uh, that, that number was also increasing steadily since 1966, which was like 8% in 1966 and uh, went up to 37% in uh, 2001. So uh, while the uh, number of doctorate degrees awarded to men peaked in 1966 and then afterwards it was fallen down. So with, with this brief review, with this brief very eliminating review showing that the woman in science is not new, and from centuries, they have their great contribution to society and science. Uh, and then further, I would like to move to uh, the questions which I had to address here. The first is that what is the biggest mistake I made during my career path? So, uh, well, I mean, I was, uh, I always wanted to be in science, and I'm in science, so I don't really think so. I, I made a mistake. <laughs> So, and the second point here that how did I get involved in the career of science? So, as far as I remember, since my school days, I was, uh, it was just science and maths used to make sense to me. And uh, uh, I was not very much inclined to history and literature and other subjects. And 
On the other hand, in my family also, from my grandfather to all my siblings, everybody is in science. So it was like I was growing up in the environment of science. So that's how I was there in science. And when I was doing my master's, I came across with a gentleman, uh, Professor P.S. Murthy. I, I was doing my research with, uh, uh, with him. And, uh, he introduced me to the real research, and his, and his definition of research just blew my mind, and it left a remarkable effect on me. And uh, his dedication to research is, I mean, he is in his 90s now, but he's still in science. So his dedication was just, uh, uh, it, it was a remarkable effect on me. And uh, there was one more person, Professor Ramesh Chandra, who was my PhD mentor at Delhi University. So uh, he became the professor in his early 30s. And then he became the founder of a biomedical institution at the heart of Delhi University. So those were the two people uh, inspired me a lot to, uh, to remain in the science. So working with these uh, such great uh, people, uh, led me to the path of science, and there onwards, I I was like, okay, I decided to make it my career, and uh, uh, my first research, my uh, my PhD was on the therapeutic effects of uh, natural products for the treatment of diabetes, and uh, there I I was uh, working on natural products, medicine plants, and all, and that time I got to know that that nature has a solution to everything. So, and uh, there onwards, I just wanted to explore more and more nature and its resources. And uh, in 2009, it was the first time I came to United States for Gordon Research Conference. And there, I met Dr. Mandy Hall Ford. And uh, that was the first time I knew that the uh, marine sea, sea snails can, uh, I mean, produce toxins which can be uh, lethal as well as can be so beneficial to the mankind. So, uh, that's how I ended up being here. I just wanted to uh, research more on natural products and its effects. And the last question was, uh, OK, how do I balance my academic research and life pressures? So um, one thing I have learned in my life that uh, if you enjoy doing something, you will not feel pressure of it. And that's what goes with me. Since I was working with so dedicated people, during my doctorate, and even here also, the work became my hobby. And uh, that's what I learned. Uh, like, this is how I balance my life and work. And uh, since my childhood also, I was seeing my parents. They had the dedicated time for their work, for the family, and for their friends. And uh, uh, that's how it goes with me. I mean, I try to keep myself updated with the reading research articles, at least uh, keep updated in my field, and, uh, and I, I, I also have dedicated time to talk to my friends, my families, and everybody. And I'm blessed to have uh, such friends and, uh, and, and my family. So that's how it goes. I mean, it's all balanced. <laughs> and I'm really happy with that. So OK, coming to my research, as I said, that we are working on uh, neurotoxins, which come from these marine snails. So belonging to superfamily conoidae, uh, there are three genera, cone snails, turrets, and terebrids. So there has a lot of work has already been done on cone snails. And uh, in 2004, there was a drug approved by FDA for the treatment of uh, uh, chronic pain in, um, in AIDS and cancer patients, which was from one of the cone snail species. So, and, uh, uh, and the same thing has been known for terebrid snails also, that they also have uh, uh, venom apparatus, and they also secrete toxins, which can be uh, very potential to the ion channels. So this is the picture showing that the venom apparatus present in corn snails. So that's the venom bulb where the uh, toxins is stored, and it travels through the venom duct, and it's uh, and it's then injected to the prey through the proboscis to the radular teeth harpoon, and. Uh, this, uh, the same thing has been also investigated to find in terebrid toxins. So this is the uh, snail toxin. How do the target to the ion channel? Okay. So uh, they can block voltage-gated sodium channels, and they can block. Uh, that's how they uh, they break the action potential, and uh, they can block the calcium channels, and they uh, stop the neurotransmitter release to the other cells. And uh, so that's the way uh, these toxins work.
So uh, they inhibit the specific signals to the central nervous system, such as pain. So in this picture, we see here that uh, every species can produce like from 50 to 200 different toxins. And this we can see here uh, with the highlighted red box that uh, they produce the toxins which are uh, cysteine rich, having disulfide framework in it. So, uh, and then they can be further divided into different superfamilies on the basis of the number of cysteines they have. And then they can be further divided into uh, different families on the, on the basis of their cysteine scaffolds. And the same cysteine scaffold can act on different channels, as we see here, sodium, potassium, calcium channels. So uh, that's how it goes with the tetrotoxins. Also, we, we are in a path to, to, to discover a drug uh, which, can, um, which can act maybe like Prel or maybe for some other neurological disorders. So I am uh, in the lab working on uh, uh, on a snail toxin peptide, which is from the Teribera variegata species. It is a 23 amino acid residue. So we synthesize it in lab. And uh, this, uh, the picture A shows here the, uh, when we synthesize it, we purify it using HPLC, and this is a single P. So, and the C uh, figure, you see that uh, it's a mass of, uh, um, the mass spectrum, mass spectrum of the single peak. So the linear expected mass was 2316, and what we observed was 2317, which is plus one. So, and uh, then after we get this linear peptide, to get the peptide in its active form, we need to fold it, and that's how it is present in the physiological conditions. So we just use this uh, glutathione and uh, uh, this redox buffer and do the air oxidation, and that's how we get different folded species. And then from uh, those folded species, we try to um, get a single single major species, which uh, can be uh, seen in figure B. This is one of the major species. Uh, this is one of the major folded species here. And the, the clear peak shows that it's a single peptide. And uh, as we see that the, uh, in the sequence, that there are six cysteine residues. So if it makes the disulfide bond, it's, uh, the mass is going to reduce by six uh, Daltons, and that's what the folded expected mass was 2310.823, and the observer was 2310. So we were able to uh, make the folded peptide. So uh, then after we we get the uh, folded peptide, now now we would like to know if it is active on ion channels or not. So uh, what we use uh, in our lab is the uh, neuromuscular tissue of the crayfish, which right there in the picture. And uh, the fi figure one shows here, this is the normal signal, uh, um, the, the normal pulse without applying any toxin on uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential. And when we apply the, the folded trixie toxin at 10 micromolar concentration, you see here in the figure two, it just blocks all the channels and there is no signal. And uh, it, it was a reversible inhibitor. And after four consecutive washes, we get the signal back. And to compare our data with the standard, we were using spider AG, omega AGA toxin at one micromolar concentration, which is a calcium channel blocker. So we can, uh, so with these preliminary results, we were able to summarize that um, that it has it has an inhibitory effect on EPSP. So t for summarizing my work, so uh, we were able to make 21 residue trixie peptide successfully synthesize and characterize, and then it was oxidatively fold, which was confirmed by HPLC and mass analysis. So uh, uh, and then it was active also. So what work is in progress now is that the disulfide. So after we know that uh, the peptide is active, we would like to know that. How are the cysteines connected in, within, the, within the peptide? So that's what is called disulfide mapping, which can be done either by partial reduction and alkylation procedure using. OK. So that can be done by partial reduction and alkylation. And we, were, uh, we are getting good results in that. And that can also be done by NMR analysis. And, uh, Further, we would like to know that now it is active on channels. So we would further like to know that what specific channel is going to act on. So that can be done uh, using Xenopus oocytes. And we are also doing recombinant synthesis of these peptides uh, using traditional cloning strategies as well as uh, ligation-independent cloning.
So I would like to uh, thank uh, a PI, Dr. Mandy Hallford, and Dr. Hua, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Hua for the electrophysiological work, and Dr. Emmanuel Chang for helping us with the mass spectrometry data, and the graduate students of our lab, Liz and Alex, and uh, all the undergrad students working with us. And I would uh, like to acknowledge uh, Brian Tad and Pete Drake's uh, at Rockefeller University, they are our collaborators. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agnet. So we just please hang with us a little bit longer, please. So we have two last speakers, and they're the students, one from the geology department, which actually two of them, but they're going to speak combinedly, and then one from the OT, OT department, right? So for the geology department, we have Darlene DeFabio and Avenel Cunningham, and they're just going to say a little few words to us. So can you guys come to the podium real quick? And please fill out the, the survey. Don't forget to fill out the survey before you leave. Got it, Hi, I'm Avenel, and um, I have something to say, but I'll just speak from the top of my head. I started sciences in high school. I'm from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and I was steered towards um, science in high school because we had this competitive system, so they took the best students and put them in the science classes. So that's how I got, it, got started in high, um, sciences. And I became interested in environmental science because I did a summer program that was studying different impacts that the environment was having on um, the Caribbean and like the shorelines and stuff like that. And I decided to apply First, I wanted to be a doctor, but I didn't like blood, and pe I didn't think I was good with people like that. So I decided I wanted to do environmental health science, so I came to York. But when I started my um, degree, I realized that the, the program didn't exist. So I had to switch like after two years. And um, I spoke to faculty, and I was advised to do geology. That's where I started geology. And I met Dr. Dar, who he's a really good professor. And he, he's a good mentor, because he encouraged us to do sciences and research. And I started doing research on um, Jamaica Bay and the impact that the pollutants and stuff have on the water there. And I used um, wet chemistry, to, the Ferrosy method, to examine the, I'm nervous, um, the, the impact that the groundwater and the, the, um, the sewer <laughs> was was having on the water. Um, the Jamaica Bay is an urbanized shoreline, and it's it's described as a small estuary where the source of fresh water is mainly anthropogenic, and the groundwater supply is less than ten percent, and there is largely an input of treated wastewater. Um, the, this is because there are four major and two minor wastewater treatment plants in Jamaica Bay and about three capped landfills. The area character um, characterized mostly by shallow water channels with estimated 7 to 35 days residence time of water and salt marshes. Also, there are high amounts of raw sewage and stormwater drainage in this area and the subway watering system has affected this area due to the water table levels which are above the area where underground subways were previously constructed. Uh, I used, I you, um, studied the iron content in this water because this, the preliminary, preliminary study showed that iron was occurring with other heavy metals there. Um, also, 
there was um okay basically um there was an increase in iron too in the water which may become toxic to the ecosystem in that area so dolly would continue <laughs> hi good afternoon i'll try and go fast i talk fast as it is so I am a graduate student. I graduated here from York College, so congratulations to all of you who are getting ready to graduate. You made it. I did. I am uh, enrolled in master's program at Brooklyn. Um, and how did I get started in science? Well, I do not come from, from a traditional college family. I'm the first person in my family to actually graduate with a college degree. Thank you. <laughs> Try telling them that. They're like, what are you killing yourself for? I'm like, you need to. <laughs> um, I, I started off at Queensboro because I did not graduate high school. I had a GED, so I went to a community college first. Um, and it was in my last year there where I found that I was in love with science, uh, at mostly astronomy and geology. So here I am at your college, well, was uh, as a major in geology, and now I'm continuing my geology studies at Brooklyn. Um, for my career mistakes, I'm not sure that I made any. I don't think I don't take anything that happened along the way as something I wish wouldn't have happened or something I did I regret. I feel like everything that I've encountered in my path uh, on my way to college and throughout college has helped me and I've gained lots of experience from it. Um, right before I graduated Queensborough, I gave birth to my daughter who is now four years old. So I could, probably could have waited. That may be something, <laughs> but um, actually looking at her though, that leads me to how do I juggle all of my life pressures and work and having a child and going to school, doing research, um, I make my priority her. And by making my priority her, it's much easier for me to realize how important my studies are and how important doing my research is because if I don't do it, how am I going to support her? How am I going to take care of her? And I would not have been able to make it through York if it wasn't for Miss Yates back there and running that wonderful program that they have across the street, which is the York Child and Family Center. <laughs> Um, I, I just want to say, I guess, to everyone in here, all of us women who are doing sciences, keep going. I've attended lots of conferences, international, and I, what a typical geologist looks like is not us. <laughs> I mean, York College was the most diverse, diverse school that, that was at any of these conferences that I've been to. And, and there's mostly women in our program and lots of minorities. So I would just like to say keep going. And your college has done a great job. Thanks to your college, I was able to actually go to graduate school from funding from them and, and Miss Hewitt in, in the uh, sponsored research office. So without her, I wouldn't even be going to graduate school. So thank you very much to your college. <laughs> That was very encouraging words, Sterling. <laughs> and last but not least, our beautiful student from the Occupational Therapy Department is Danette Lynch. Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Danette Lynch, and I am a York College student majoring in Occupational Therapy. Um, a little bit about myself. In 2002, I was a student and I was exposed to occupational therapy in a mental health setting in Barbados. At that time, I was also exposed to physical therapy and speech therapy. I fell in love with occupational therapy because I saw myself doing it and it offered a way to get involved with people that the others did not. I finished my associates in rehabilitation therapy technology and applied to the bachelor's master's program at York. And as the saying goes, the rest is history. For those of you who are interested in occupational therapy, it is becoming one of the fastest growing professions in the United States. It is a helping profession and occupational therapists engage people in the job of living. At present, Occupational therapists must hold a master's degree and must take a licensing exam in order to practice in New York State. Some programs offer a combined bachelor's and master's degree, such as our very own New York College. Um, in terms of balancing my studies and life pressures, there are three things that I, I think for me, they're very important. 
My family, they're an awesome support network. Most of them are in Barbados, but they continue to be my inspiration. The second thing, really good friends who keep me grounded and they're both in the program right now and outside. And three, and I think this is a must, still continue to enjoy the things that you like to do. Um, moving on, occupational therapists look at how people learn and relearn activities so that they can participate um, in doing what they want to do in life. Part of occupational therapy looks at research on the best ways to get people to learn and the efficacy of techniques of treatment. Last semester, during the undergrad component of the OT program, my colleagues and I took a class in advanced activity analysis. As part of this class, our professor, Dr. Kaplan, required us to complete a research project. Students were asked to observe how someone learns a task with and without intervention. We used a ring toss activity as our skill to be learned and had two participants, one as a control who only practiced the task from a distance. The other participant received intervention by making the task simpler. Both subjects underwent a pre and a post test. We analyzed motor aspects of the task, including the participant's stance, throw, and achieving the goal. We concluded that motor learning occurred for both subjects. However, during practice sessions, the subject re receiving the intervention demonstrated less variable movement than the control. On the post test, they used the same amount of strategies and the participant with the intervention accomplished the goal more frequently. Research is part of occupational therapy standards of practice and a requirement for the degree and the profession. This research project made me see a simple motor task differently. I had to think of all the steps of learning something as simple as throwing a ring on a stick so that when I'm working with patients, it will enable me to focus on their steps to get into the goal. Occupational therapists have skill expertise in activity analysis. In analyzing an activity that a client may be involved in or want to do, the occupational therapist is able to break that activity down into its simplest components and prescribe the best fit for the client, whether it is increasing the complexity of the task or decreasing it. The end. <laughs> the end. Oh. <laughs> we just would like to resume the Women Leadership Colloquium at second annual Women's Leadership Colloquium. We just thank you, each one of you, for coming and staying with us for all this time, for all the faculty members, every person from the committee who put the effort and put this event together. And I would like to end up this with a quote that I found um, while I was trying to prepare for this. So it is from Luciano de Crescenzo, and he says, we are each of us angels with only one wing, and we can only fly embracing each other. So with that being said, I would like to each one of us continue doing research in any of the fields that we are in the science and continue to encourage each of the women to continue to encourage other women to get in this field and just continue embracing that, okay? So with that being said, I would like you to all of you come by the poster and see all of the presenters and thank you very much for coming.